we like to say some things in this church, and one of them is Happy Sabbath. It's not even an adjective anymore. It's like a prefix to the word Sabbath. We say it because we like to be happy. In fact, we have a lot of things we use the word happy with. And happiness is something that seems to be part of the way we want to be and feel. I know it's one of those words. It has a lot of different uh, ideas packed behind it. But essentially, we all want to be happy. You know, I've heard a lot of people in life that have had uh, a lot of things taken from them. And I've known a lot of poor people in life. And I've known a lot of people that's gone through a lot of tragedies and sorrows. And it's the one thing that they say that they want the most. It's not money. It's not, I wish I could have this or that I was married or... It's always, I just want to be happy. One day on a construction site, I was singing a song that I had been in my head after the church service. This was a Monday morning, and it was the theme was about happiness. And for some reason, contemplatively, I just kind of blurted out the word happy. And my co-worker said, oh, <laughs> a delusional concept. And then he went on this tirade, this rant for about 20 minutes of why he believes in this world that happiness is something that cannot be obtained in the human family. And, you know, when you spend enough time with people, especially in the construction world, because before I was a pastor, I was an electrician, and I spent a lot of time in construction working with all kinds of people, you know, a lot of people believe that happiness cannot be obtained. A lot of people really feel that it is like a pot of gold at the end of rainbow. You know, a, a, a unicorn experience. But yet, down deep side in the human channels, no one wants to concede the fact that I can't really be happy. Everybody wants some measure or some form of happiness, and it's what drives us, a relentless pursuit of it. It's why it's right there in our Declaration of Independence. Every man has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We believe it should be part of our birthright in this country to find some way to be happy, and yet we find that we're always looking for it. And the fact is, and the issue is, that it's not that we can't be happy, it's that we really just don't know how to be happy. And so the story that I choose today to go to, John chapter 4, it's how to be happy, but in a very strange way, a very ironic way of happiness is what I want to look at. There is a place where I'm from. In Central Texas, not too far where I was raised up, um, in Wimberley actually, and it's called Jacob's Well. And Jacob's Well is called Jacob's Well because of this huge natural artesian spring that flows up. And it's this gigantic pool of water, you know, the size of this entire sanctuary. It's surrounded by ancient rock. And families have been gathering there for generations upon generations. It is known as a place of happiness. It is known of a place where people go to experience good times with families and friends. But the reason why it gets its name Jacob's Well is because right in the middle of the pool of water, the blue-green, beautiful water, there is an ominous dark hole just going down very, very deep. And, you know, years later, people have discovered trying to dive down that it's really not a pool of water, it's a cave. It's an underwater cave. And the first part of Jacob's well is a 30-foot shaft. It's likened to Homer's Odyssey. He had the sirens calling you down, down, down. Because as the sunlight is, is coming through and refracting through the water, it's lined, that limestone is lined with crystals. And it, they just sparkle. And so you can imagine floating on the top of the well and then wanting to just see how far you can go down and what you can experience and look around. Well, it's been a famous attraction of underwater divers because of the, the potential of what's down there. Well, divers come from all over the world to go to that little place in Central Texas to check out Jacob's Well. And they've mapped it out fairly well. They learned that after you go down that 30 foot, foot uh, incline, it opens up into what's called the first chamber. And the first chamber, when you swim to the bottom of the first chamber or you dive down, you're about 60 feet below the surface. And it's just this gigantic cavern, you know, just direction everywhere, endless. But then there's another opening and you go down into the second chamber. And at the bottom of the second chamber, you're about 100 feet below the surface. But then there is a narrow slit down there at the bottom, bottom of the second chamber, a very small little slit, and it's called uh, the entrance into the virgin cave. And it's extremely dangerous. 
You know, today you can't go down in there because they've barred it off. But back in the 70s, you could go down in there and dive down in there. And Jacob's Well is a place that a man named Ken Maupin found himself. Hearing about this famous place where all kind of excitement and happiness could be had. He was a thrill seeker like many people that dare to do that. He decided that he was going to go to Jacob's Well, get some diving gear, go down into the shaft and go to the first chamber, go into the second chamber, but be one of the first people to ever squeeze through the narrow crack of the third chamber and go into a, an abyss and a darkness and who knows what's on the other side of it. And so Ken Maupin goes to the third chamber and he's never seen again. And the word goes out, Maupin lost in Jacob's well. Well, this is in the 70s, a time when people just assumed there's no telling where. I mean, that thing could open up into an entire underwater aquifer. He could be somewhere, anywhere under the state of Texas now. So he was left. No one searched. Teams don't go down there. But in the 90s, a research team wanted to map out the third chamber, you know, technology, and they have all kind of safety systems and guide ropes. And so they go to Central Texas, and, and they're going to the first chamber, and they get down into the second chamber, and there's the, the, the narrow slit, and they squeeze through one by one, and when they get through, they turn on their light, and it is the most beautiful thing. They describe it, these guys chronicle this, they describe it as, as like angels floating on the top of the earth. It's just this giant blue orb of crystal clear water. And they're just shining as far as they can see, you know, looking all around. And then all of a sudden, terror seizes them. And they look right down to the right where they're coming in up into the slit and they look down over there and there they see a set of tanks a deflated suit, and the skeletal remains of Ken. Now, <laughs> it's a beautiful place. It's crystal clear. There's nothing but limestone walls. What in the world happened to Ken? And a little panic seized them because there's a, is there something in here that we don't know about? What happened? How did he die? He actually wasn't too far from the opening. Well, they looked at that, investigated a little bit, took the pictures and chronicled what they found and decided to descend down, down to the very bottom. And so they, on their way to their descent down, they figure out what happened to him. And it was really a, a terrifying event for them. As they're descending down, as they're descending down to the bottom of the cave, they get almost to the bottom and they begin to flap their flippers and they realize that the bottom is not the bottom. The bottom is about three foot of silt. And instamatically, they're like, they described it like being in a snow globe, being shook up. And as they panicked, the entire cavern was filled with silt. They said their visibility was zero. They lost their orientation. They couldn't have no clue where they were at. And they began to panic and the only thing that saved them was the tagline. They each knew it was connected to them. They grabbed their line and they pulled themselves one by one out the slit and then they knew what happened to Ken Maupin. Ken goes down into a cave looking for happiness, looking for something to fill him because he was desperately empty, talking to his friends and families. He was a depressed man. He needed something from life. And he decides to, to pull off something that no one has done, slips through the virgin cave down to the floor. It's so beautiful in here. And he gets to the floor and all of a sudden, in seconds, he has no clue where he is. He doesn't know if he's swimming up, down, east, west, north, south. And he literally just runs out of air. And he dies. And it becomes one of these famous lessons for mankind. This is what John 4 is. Many lessons in John 4, but one of the great lessons is this, that we are all at Jacob's well sometimes. We can be at Jacob's well looking for happiness, looking for something that satisfies, looking for something to fill us while we're waiting on the second coming of Christ. And before we know it, end up in a snow globe of disillusionment, the snow globe of brokenness. We, ex we go to these things that we think are going to make me happy, right? I think the Texans might go all the way this year. And I think that would make me happy watching an entire season of sports on Sunday. And year after year, it would let me down over and over and more disillusioned, more unhappy. Well, if I would buy this, I could span this. If I could do this in my life, 
If I could get just back to this part of the country, this part of the world. If this would just work out for me, if I could get my bills paid off, if I could make it through school, if I could work out my relationships, I would be happy in time and time and time again. We find ourselves not only unhappy still, but deeper and deeper down into the abyss and the pit of despair. And that's what New Start is. New Start is filled with people. They come every session. And their lives are a shipwreck. Their health is a wreck because what's been driving their bad health and their bad eating habits has been emptiness. And finally, giving up, succumbing to sitting on a couch, watching TV all night, eating food that's killing them. And they know it. For me, <laughs> that was my life story early in life. Always looking for something to thrill me. Always looking for something to satisfy me. And you know what? I went back home to Texas just a couple of weeks ago. I went back and, and I was already doing what I always do. I have a proclivity. The flesh has a proclivity to try to make itself happy. It always does. You can't get away from it. It's part of the broken human channels, the foul nature. It always is trying to figure it out itself. You know, you're looking around, you expand, you can do. And, and, I, and I, my parents, I can't believe this. I love mom and dad in case they see this, right? I love them. But they're 80. Pops is 80. All through childhood, we moved from place to place to place to place. They were farmers. They were antique salesmen. They were this. They were that. And they're 80 years old, and they're moving again. I like, Dad. And they bought this bread, big, huge RV. They're going to travel. They're going to move. They're at eighty, and that tells me I'm on the same track. I got the same problems. I'm thinking that somehow something that I find in this world or do or achieve is going to make me happy. And we fall into this trap, and it can't. There is nothing. There is nothing of this world that we can do or think of or contrive of our own self that comes from the material world that makes a man happy. I know it's kind of like a de facto saying. We all say it, but we really don't mean it. Philosophers, the greatest men of all time, some of the great philosophers debated this question. It was one of the central debates of philosophy. It was what makes man happy. The cynics came along, and Diogenes, one of the great cynics, this was a guy, if you remember your history from Greek history, he lived in a barrel. And it was the famed Alexander the Great that came along one day, and he saw Diogenes in a barrel, half naked, eating food that people had thrown to him, and he said, if I was not Alexander, I would want to be Diogenes. Their, their idea was to do away with anything that was material, become ascetics. But the cynics turned out not to be a very happy group of people because they, someone else came along and, and displaced them and the world was looking okay. It was the Epicureans and the Epicureans was just the opposite. And they were like, hey, if we really want to be happy, indulge the material world. There's no good, there's no bad, no evil, no God, no devil. Just go out there and get all you can get. Take all that you can take and have all the fun that you can possibly have and you will be happy. But the Epicureans have a legacy that was not happiness. Marx came along and said mankind would be happy if socialism or communism, one of those isms, and a hundred years later we all know that there is no happiness in any of that. Buddhism with its eightfold paths to happiness. My dad, when I was a kid, he was into Buddhism. So I remember these books we had in the house, you know, The, the Path of Happiness. They're all into happiness through detachment. And yet you can go to any Buddhist country today and they are just as ripped and torn with war and strife and murder among the Buddhists. It was a failure. And Solomon, writing to all the God followers, the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians, what does he say in Ecclesiastes at the end of it? Vanity of vanities. There's no happiness nowhere except one place. And if you know Ecclesiastes, where does he go? At the end of it, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. He wraps it all up. Fear God. Keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every work into judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. He's hitting at a very powerful truth. A man that God allowed to be the most happiest man that could ever be. If anyone could be happy, it could be Solomon. You might disagree with this if you're married, but if anyone could be happy through women, he had how many? A lot of women. It didn't make him happy. He had money so much that silver was as common as stones in his day. 
It didn't make him happy. He had wisdom. No one smarter than this guy. God gave him all wisdom. Didn't make him happy. At the end, what he is saying is the only thing that can make man happy is to come into reality and truth about their sinful nature and let God do something about it. And that's our story in John chapter 4 that we're going to go to. Yep. We can learn this from another Jacob's well. And it's the one that I really want to turn to. Not the one in central Texas, but the one in Samaria 2,000 years ago. Jesus is on his way to a place. And you know, if you understand the point of of John chapter 4. Man, there's been so many things preached on it, so many great points and, and main ideas. I'm not disparaging any one of them because it has a multifaceted text. But one of the great themes of John 4 that comes out is how to be happy. All right? It's one of its major ideas. Here is a woman that the Bible doesn't say she's unhappy, but we know from the time of the day that she's gathering her water that something's wrong. There's some kind of isolation. There's some kind of a feeling. Something's gone in her life that she doesn't want to be around people. She's kind of an outcast. We know from the story she's been in and out of relationships. She's just got this picture, and especially if you're reading Desire of Ages, this orb of a person that is just not happy because her situation is bad. So Jesus picks this woman, this story, this time of this day to be an illustration for 2,000 years on how to be happy. And that's what's so impressive about some of these words. right? In the very first verse right there, it said Jesus needed to go to Samaria. I like to look at it like this. He needed to teach not just this woman how to be happy, but all of mankind how to be happy. And it's through an irony that it happens. The way that we can be happy is a way that makes us unhappy at first. Happiness is not achieved by something that makes me feel good or gives me security or relief. It's something that at first makes me really ugh, angst, something that makes me uncomfortable, something I don't want to confront. But then that's the portal, the way to happiness. And her story reveals that. But before he can bring her into true happiness, he has to ask her something. And in verse 7, in John chapter 4, it says this, a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. An interesting topic, and there's been a lot of commentary on this, giving me a drink. And give me a water. He starts this entire thing that he's going to teach mankind for 2,000 years how to be happy. He starts the entire lesson by telling people, Oh, I asked her for a drink of water. And there's been good things written. The drink of water was an entering wedge. It was a way to, to make her comfortable, to disarm her. But really, what is he asking in that drink of water? What does he really want? Because that is, man, this is the lesson of lessons. Because what he is asking for her to give to him is what he's asking you and I, and it's the secret to our happiness. What is he really asking by saying, give me that water? Give me a drink. Well, we get right to it. In verse, chapter, verse 9 of chapter 4, let's look at what he's asking her. Well, then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And then later she starts dabbling again in religion. She starts trying to turn the conversation to theological debate. What is that really about? What is verse 9 really about? You can read some of this in Desire of Ages. It's really a great thought. He's got to get past before he can make her happy, step number one, and for us, he's got to get past her religious security. Her paradigm that she's built all around her. What she feels salvation is, what she feels has given her entrance into heaven. Oh, okay, whatever you got to say doesn't matter because our father Jacob has given us this well. You know Jacob, right? Abraham and Isaac and the 12 patriarchs. She is given kind of like a religious pedigree. She's got some, some intelligence about God, and she's got this, this matting of, of her own religious experience that nothing can get into. She's safe. She's good. She has security in her religious understanding. Christ has got to get through that. She's got to give that to him, or it's over with. The story's probably never written. And in my religious experience, before he could ever bring me true happiness, this is the exact step he had to get me through. In fact, it took him 10 years to do it. 
I was not a happy camper at 18 years old. I had all kind of dreams and ambitions and scholarships and football and track and a young woman that I was about to marry. I had all these things, but something was telling me I wasn't happy. I had been out of church for three or four years. My high school years in Texas, I left like every other one did because football was on Friday nights. And sports and entertainment, it was all so fun. I was so wrapped up in it all. But I was unhappy. And I remember when I came into the church for the first time, they had just built a brand new church. And I came into that church and I knew, whew, there's something here that I miss. And so I talked to the pastor, Harry Adams. I said, what do I got to do to get back into church? He says, well, you've never been baptized, right, Damon? I said, no. He said, well, you need to be baptized. I'm like, okay, baptized. What do I got to do to do that? Well, I'm going to send you to old Mr. A.G. and he's going to go through and here, here they are. This is my religious security, by the way. This is my 14 Amazing Facts Bible studies, the very ones they gave me. And so I did a checklist. Oh, well, is there, it, it, what you don't know won't hurt you, right? There's an evil plan out there, and God's love, Jesus loves you, it's still there, the colossal city in space, and, and you are responsible for the law of God, and don't be fooled, the Sabbath the millennium, the state of the dead, hell. I went through all of the doctrinal beliefs, who the mark comes from, who the beast is, what the seal is at the end of time. You got the right day. You got the right way. You're okay. And I felt this. This was my security. I never looked at my life. I never looked at my experience. I never looked at the way that I was treating my wife. It didn't mean anything to me that we would yell and scream and holler and cuss. It meant nothing to me that within a year of our marriage I was fooling around. It meant nothing to me because I had my religiosity. I'm not denigrating this. Very important stuff. But it was like a force field around me. I felt secure that no matter what I did in my personal life, no matter how detached I was from Christ and the Holy Spirit, no matter how sinful my life was, this gave me a sense of I'm okay because I got the truth. And the first thing that I had to give Christ in order for me to truly find real happiness was my religious security. I had to lay it down and realize, ooh, there may be something else working here. The second thing that he has to get through in order to give her true happiness is now verse 10. For verse 11 and 12, in verse 10, he's offering her now. He's playing around. He's like, hey, I've, I got a gift here I want to give you. I want to give you something powerful. And then verse 11 and 12 is the second thing she's got to give up. He's got to get this, and this was a tough one. Matter of fact, this is probably the toughest. Because once you lay down the religious security, now you're a little vulnerable. Now there's something else he's got to get through. Verse 11 and 12, The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Who gave the well to him and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Look at all the interrogatives. I'm offering you something that I know you need. You don't know that you need. I've got you to kind of lay down your religious like hedge around you. Now he's got to get through her own pride and hubris. Who, what, when, why? She doubts. He's offering her something great, something grand, something beautiful. And she doubts it. She doesn't believe it because she's got her own ideas of what she thinks happiness is. I mean, every single one of us have been offered greater things than these. We are 2,000 years advanced. We have spirit of prophecy. We know what's been offered to us. We know the possibilities, the potentials we talked about in Sabbath school that are right there for the taking, but we seem to have doubt about it. We disbelieve. We got our own ways of thinking. And it's really all called pride. I've got to let go of what I think matters. What I think means nothing. I have learned that in almost 50 years now, that what I think is usually wrong. I mean, listen to what Isaiah says in chapter 55 of verse 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. In other words, you need to be quiet when I come to you and offer you and trying to show you something. You need to realize that you don't know nothing. You don't know a thing. You think you do. In your mind, your understanding is just this little bitty snippet of a greater reality out there that I can see. And until we are willing to let the Spirit of God come in and show us what we need 
instead of constantly telling him what I need, we're not going to get nowhere. We have to have that vulnerability. I have to lay aside the religiosity, the, the security I have in being a Seventh-day Adventist. I've got to put that over here. And then now I've got to put my pride down, and I've got to be willing to admit that maybe I've been wrong about a lot of things. Oh, Listen to this quote from Prophets and Kings. Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet more invincible than the soul that, than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on God. That's where we've got to be. The soul that feels its nothingness. And to put some meaning behind that, the soul that realizes he doesn't know anything. Damon's need, you, you are a wreck. You, you look what you've done to your life. Are you ready now to listen to me and quit asking me who, what, when, where, why, how, and when, especially? I'm always asking God when, when, when. This is what Proverbs 3 is all about, right? Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. This is what the woman at the well has to do. She has to turn from her own understanding. If she doesn't do this, the story's over with. It's never written. I grew up, I told you, in the construction world, and there is nothing more that men hate than this concept of turning from yourself and saying, you know, God, I really can't figure it out. Uh, I used to carry this little metal clip around. It was a jumper. It's a little piece of metal that connects two terminal points together where electricity can flow through both of them. I used to carry it in my pocket everywhere I went. I don't know what happened to it, but I used to keep it as a reminder. One day I was on the job site and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with this electrical can. It was a big motor control center and there was something wrong and I had the prints and I had been there for hours and hours and the foreman was like, Sneed, you got that up yet? No, not, not yet, I'm, I'm working on it. And then you know, an hour later, Sneed, we gotta have that motor up. I wanna send someone to help you. No, 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 I got it, I'm almost about ready to got it. I got it, I got it, I got it. And then pretty soon, another hour later, Sneed, I'm sending so-and-so over. And I'm like, oh, I gotta hurry up before he gets here. And I'm working and I'm working and then he's sitting over my shoulder and then a superintendent comes and they're all, and I'm just sweating and I'm trying and they're like, Sneed, you need to look at this. And I don't want no one to tell me because I don't want them to figure it out. I gotta figure it out for myself. And finally, they kind of push me to the side. The foreman looks in there, takes a screwdriver and he pulls that jumper out, shuts the door and hits the button and the pump comes on. And then he hands it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, I just sit there, and I'm not happy because the problem got fixed. I am devastated because I didn't fix it. This Samaritan woman has got to get that in her head. You can't fix it. Seventh-day Adventist, we cannot fix the problems. You cannot solve the issue, the debate between who should be here or what woman should serve or not serve. You cannot solve the debates going on in the church. They are beyond our capacity anymore. The church is in a place that we have to say, we cannot do it, God. We cannot figure it out. We can't even manage our own lives. You and you alone must come in now. And the woman's story where he takes her next is why he and he alone can fix our problems in our church and in our daily lives. Oh man, once she gets past step one and two, now he takes her. If she can lay down her religious security, right? You can lay down this. And if you can lay down all of your pride and your desire to be the man that gets it right, to win the debate, to get the art, if you can lay aside that pride, now you're ready for the third step. <laughs> and it's the step we don't want to take. It's the step that we hate. Let's go right here. Spirit of Prophecy, Desire of Ages, page 188, before I take you to the text. And the white says this. Jesus now abruptly turned the conversation. Right? Lay aside your... She did that. She laid aside her religiosity, her, her security. Okay, she laid down her pride and she's... I got her attention. Now watch. He turned the conversation. Before this soul could receive the gift he longed to bestow, bestow she must be brought to recognize her sin and her Savior. This is how He heals. This is how He brings happiness. This is, is what our church needs. It's what you need. It's what your marriage needs. It's what your children need. 
Once they lay down aside the fact that they're secure because they think they're an Adventist and they got the right day and they'll never receive the mark of the beast. When they lay that down and get a little vulnerable and they lay down their pride, now God's going to bring them into a place of ultimate vulnerability and say, I'm going to show you what's making you unhappy first. And what makes all of us unhappy is always sin. It's always that. That sin is what separates us from God. And before He can show us real happiness and fill us truly with His Spirit, He's got to get down in there first. Sanctification is always preceded by justification. It is always the fruit to the repentance that God is seeking. And repentance is not a one-time thing. It is a daily experience which has a daily fruit. A sanctified, transformed, changed life. Oh, man. Verse 16, he's asking her to confront her sin. Now, he's got her right where, where he wants her. It's like David, you remember. David had committed a terrible sin. For all practical intents and purposes, for one year, he seemed like a happy man. I mean, he had the kingdom. He had all the wealth of his father. He had all these women. But we know he was miserable because of why? His sin, right? With what he did with Bathsheba and you or I. No one knew about this. A year goes by. God knows he's miserable. And his true happiness isn't going to be in conquering more kingdoms or, or having another child with his, his true happiness first. God has got to clear the table and get right to David's heart. And he sends Nathan the prophet to tell him a parable about a man with one little sheep and a man with thousands. And this one man takes his little sheep and kills it. And then Nathan says, what do we do with the man? And David says, oh, he's got to restore fourfold. He's angry. And Nathan says, thou art the man. And David goes on and writes Psalm 51. Oh, man, create in me a clean heart, O God. I acknowledge my sin. Against you and only you have I sinned. For I was born in iniquity, shaping in sin. He confronts his sin. He acknowledges it. And now he, reads, he writes at the end of that chapter, for I restore to me the joy of my salvation. Hope, happiness, joy is only when we confront the sin of our life and we can only confront when we lay down our pride and we lay down our religious security. When we can do that as a people, and be vulnerable before the Holy Spirit. We talk about the latter rain this morning. We talked about the former rain. And we talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit. That never happens until we first do the first work of the Holy Spirit. John 16, verse 8. When He comes, we talked about that. When He comes, the day of Pentecost, when He comes, He shall convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. It's His work. It's not just to fill us with some power to go out and do things, but it's first to bring us to the place where we see what separated us from God. What is our sin? What is your problem? Why are you fighting with your husband and wife? Why can't you get along? Why are you on the verge of divorce? Why are your kids angry and upset? Why is it that you would rather watch sports than come to church? Why are you bored with Sabbath school? Why don't you come on Wednesday night? All of those whys can be answered only by the Spirit, revealing our sin so that we can have a true happiness oh man, that's, that's what I've needed my whole life. So long as Satan reigns, we shall have self to subdue, besetting sins to overcome. So long as life shall last, there will be no stopping place, no point which we can say, I have fully attained sanctification as the result of a lifelong obedience. In other words, I'm going to have to be continually giving him that drink of water he's asking for. Every day, I'm going to have to be on guard. Damon, is this your religious security over here? Is this your pride? You, 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 you think you got it all figured out now? You've done really good. Man, you're a new start chaplain. We've had 80 baptisms this year. You're, you're all preaching. Are you really doing good? i got to show you something more. Well, but Lord, I'm doing so good. And, and I, I'm, I'm surely a saved man. Damon, lay those aside i got to show you something deeper. There, there's more. Are you going to give me this water that I, I, I need to go deeper down with you? There's more down there. And I find that every time I answer that, and every time I go through that irony of unhappiness to make me happy, I actually become happy. 
I get closer to the Lord. The sanctifying spirit, it just dwells in you fuller and richer. But it always comes at the price of the removal of what's making you unhappy, which is always sin. In one fashion or another. Whether it's overt or covert or commission or omission. Whether it's sinful in itself or not, but the fact that it means more to us than God, like something as silly as sports. Or what we eat. Or how we speak or what we treat to one another. It's always sin. And this is where she goes. She has to repent. And Jesus says, go and then come. It's always the will is engaged here, right? Go and come. She has to go and she could have left right then, picked her water pot up and said, oh, he is crazy. <laughs> That's what he could, she could have done. She could have went into the city and he could have never seen her again. And that's what happens when the Spirit comes and it's driving deep down into our heart and we realize that, uh, that the fighting that's going on, the aggravation, the frustrations, the sin, when He's driving, getting really close to the issue, that's usually when we say, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. We listen to it at church. The preacher says something. Yeah, that's true. And then we go, but we never come. We leave it and we cover it up because Saturday night I can turn on the TV, forget about it Sunday, watch a bunch of games, and then, and then Monday I'm at work, and then, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, i got to get better, Lord, but we never come to the place where she comes. The Holy Spirit, it's His job to convict. It's not yours. He comes and brings the conviction. Your job is to come back. And does she come? Oh, man. Surely she does. Verse 17 and the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Later she goes and tells the men of the city, he's told me everything I've ever done. He's pointed out my sin. She's acknowledging, she's confessing. This is repentance. When the Spirit shows up and speaks, and you say, you're right. The reason why I can't get along with people is because there's probably something wrong with me. Why is everyone mad at me? <laughs> well, maybe it's you, Damon. Maybe you got your, like my mother used to say, used to hate it. She used to tell me, you always carry your feelings on your shoulders. You always get so mad, we got to tiptoe around you. My mom used to always say that. My first wife said that. Then when my second wife started saying it, when Miss Mary back there started saying, you know, you, I got to tiptoe around you sometimes. I'm like, no, I don't. Yeah, I'm, 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 you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have done that. Then the Holy Spirit comes to me at night, Damon, your mama said it. <laughs> Maybe I am sensitive. Why are you sensitive, Damon? Because I respect and I don't want to be wrong. And I won't. Oh, pride, self respect. So you don't want to be. And then boy, I got to come and say, I have no husband. <clears throat> That's how it works. But there is such freedom in that. There is such freedom. I'm going to tell you, man, there is such freedom when that comes off you. And I don't carry that no more. And I can confess and say it's my problem. And the Holy Spirit can come in. And now transformation takes place. You always got to come back. When he says go, you always got to come back. She confesses. She repents. But real happiness is found in that. Because it removes what's keeping me away from God. It removes the problems between me and my wife. It removes the problems between me and my children. I went back to Texas, was divorced 16 years ago. Terrible, devastating divorce. It just shipwrecked our life, our kids. And my kids had a lot of problems with me. My two eldest came and lived with me. But I did things terrible. I didn't focus on them, I focused on me. I let their aunt raise them, and they had a lot of animosity and bitterness built up. And, and when I went back, and, 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 and my daughters came to me, they, and they wanted to talk to me and, and, and get some of this out, and she's just turned 30, and it's bothering her. And, and, and she started saying things, and my defense mechanisms went up immediately. Like, wait, but, but, but you don't understand what your mother did to me. You don't understand. I wanted to say all that, but the Holy Spirit's like, Damon, put your pride down. Is what she's saying true? Well, yes, but there's no buts. Is what she's saying true? And, and the moment I confessed, I said, honey, I'm sorry for the way I did things those years ago. I'm sorry. The moment I confessed, the moment I came back and gave Christ that drink of water, that burden rolled right off of my shoulders. 
my daughter and myself now are so much closer. And that's the way with our relationship between us and God, our spouses, our children. And you know what? This is what Jesus is after. And he makes this absolutely clear. What you just seen transpire, and there's other things in this story. But what you have just seen, this woman, how she's come through this experience with Christ, had to lay down her religious security, had to lay down her pride, her, her way of thinking, her, her own self-sufficiency. She had to come into contact with her sin. She had to repent of it. She had to confess. She had to acknowledge it. Jesus says this is what it's all about. And we read it in verse 23 and verse 24. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. You must worship with the Spirit. And the Spirit's job is always not just to empower to do righteous things, not just to have strength to go out and give Bible studies, but the Spirit's number one job is to convict the soul of sin. And if I'm going to worship in spirit and worship in truth, that means I'm going to listen to the truth that He says about me so that I can be free from sin, so that I can have a true and genuine lasting happiness seen in my life with God and the people around me. Now to me, that's what Adventism needs. We can pray all day long and fast all day long until we let the Spirit do that kind of inner work. We're going to get nowhere. I'm so tired of someone saying, hey, read this book. It's a great book. And we read it and we get all into it and we go through these, these exercises and we all get together, we pray and we pray. Are we not praying hard enough? Do we not want it enough? I don't know. I've been going through this since I was 20. Another book, another paradigm. No, when you start practicing this, when you start saying, Lord, you expose me, you show me, let, bring me into true repentance. I'm going to lay my pride down for a while. I'm going to lay my religious security down. And I want you to show up and say, go call your husband. When the church starts saying, I have no husband, Lord, God in heaven, the Spirit will fall. He will come. He will transform. He will change. We will go out. We will finish our work. Because only the Spirit knows why we don't do it now. The woman at the well, did she become happy? Verse 28, oh man, Desire of Ages picks up on this. Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come to see a man. She focuses on this fact that she's sitting there and as she acknowledges her sin, you know, she doesn't go, oh, I'm so terrible and rotten. Uh, no. What makes her happy? Because she's standing in the presence of one that's going to give her a perfection. He's standing in the presence of one that is going to cover her with a righteousness that she does not have. He is going to forgive her. He is going to declare her just before the Father based on His righteousness alone, based on His perfect life. He is going to proclaim her righteous though she's lived a terrible life and that's the joy that, that comes up and all of a sudden the things of the world, the sins of the world, the things that she's been looking to for happiness mean nothing no more and she leaves that water pot going into the city saying, I found a Messiah. She's filled full of joy and filled full of happiness and sin has been left. Sin is represented in that water pot. The happiness of the world that she was seeking is in that water pot and she breaks away from it because of a greater joy that comes into her life. That's how you overcome sin. Listen to this in Desire of Ages. The woman had been filled with joy as she listened to Christ's words. The wonderful revelation was almost overpowering. Leaving her water pot spoke unmistakably as to the effects of His words. With a heart overflowing with gladness, she hastened on her way to impart to others the previous light she had just received. Overpowered, overwhelmed, filled with joy, full of love. The world meant nothing to her. The sin of the world she turned away from. How? Those first three steps. She had to lay this religious security away. Look, it's true. There is a power coming. There is a Sunday law coming. But that ain't going to save you because you know the right day. 
You got to lay that aside and not find security in that. Then, Damon, you got to lay aside your pride. You got to lay aside the way you think what's wrong with you because you don't know what's wrong with you, believe me. You have no clue what's going on in your life. You got to lay that aside. Come before me vulnerable. You got to let me ask you a question. Go call your husband. And I'm going to have to say, Lord, I have no husband. And if I'll do that time and time over and over, when is the last time you've been convicted of sin? You're either ready for perfection or you've lost the whole concept here in John 4. When is the last time the Holy Spirit said, go call your husband? If you haven't heard that, do what David did. You know, after he wrote Psalm 51, he went on to write Psalm 139, which is this, his prayer ever afterward. Search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me and then lead me, Lord, into the way of everlasting. Right. Search me. Try me. Lord, I am begging you to ask me to go call my husband. Show me what my sin is. Show me my problems. Show me why I'm struggling here or there. And if you'll do that, the Lord will come and he will assure you his righteousness. He will assure you his forgiveness. He will assure you that you are covered. You don't got to worry about this judgment. You're going to pass into eternal life. But oh, to boot. More than this, steps to Christ, right? But more than this, he transforms the heart. And you'll find a real happiness, not in your husband, not in your wife, not in your kids, not in your job, not in your hobbies, not in your habits, not in the Golden Warriors or the Dodgers. You'll find it in me. That's the story. You see, we're all going to find ourselves really quickly and maybe really soon at Jacob's Well. You choose. Is it the one that's going to be in Central Texas? Where you find yourself in some beautiful thing, you think, oh, this is it, I'm happy. And then you get to the bottom of it and the silt swirls over your head and you swim around until you run out of air and die. That's what the world's going to give. That's what you'll give yourself. That's what I've given myself. I know. Or you're going to find yourself at Jacob's Well in Samaria. Where I have to do a couple of tough things. I have to let the Holy Spirit get down in there. But man, happiness at Jacob's Well. And the whole thing is finished up quite well in verse 36. When Jesus drives home the point, talking to the disciples now who have just witnessed all of this transpire, all of this happen, he says this, And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. He's saying, this is what it's about, eternal life. This journey I've taken this woman through is what I want to take every single one of you through. It's what I got to go through. I have to go through it. And I guess what? I got to go through it again and deeper. I can't ever stop. I can't ever stop until probation closes and I'm sealed. Then I can stop. Until then, Lord, ask me again. Ask me for that cup of water. And I'm going to fight you. I may, my flesh may cry out. I tell the Lord this all the time. Lord, ignore my screams. Ignore me. I'm going to try to talk you out of it. I'm going to try to tell you why I don't need that or why I should be here. I'm going to be telling you and, and, and trying to work deals with you. I tell the Lord, ignore my flesh, God, because what I truly want is this. I want to be happy, and I know my happiness is in you alone. I want to follow you with all of my heart and all of my soul. I want to be transformed. I want to be changed. I want to stop sinning. And God's like, okay, I'm going to do that, but i got to show you why. Are you willing to do that? Maybe for the first time in your life, or maybe the first time in a long time, are you willing to dare for him to come and say, brother, sister, give me a drink. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we have spent some time at Jacob's well. With all our living heart and living soul, God in heaven, have mercy on us. We mean right. We have good intentions. We do want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We do want the latter rain to come. We do want to finish our work. But God, this first work must be done in our heart. And you alone know what each one of us needs in different ways. And I pray upon my own self and my own good brothers and sisters that you will come walking down those dusty roads of the Samaria. You will sit at our own well and you will ask us for a drink of water. And Lord, we may know what it means now. And God, any that responds to you, I pray that you would bless them with the joy and happiness of heaven like they have never felt before. May you be with us, Lord, richly today. In Jesus' name, amen.